Then right. let's begin at the beginning. What do you consider the most important fundamentals for bass players? Well, uh, as ridiculous as it may sound, uh, one thing that, that is kind of my pet peeve or young bassists coming up and stuff is, uh, believe it or not, the strap length. Um, my, my strap is just one piece, it doesn't adjust because I know the perfect length for me after 20 some years of playing, you know, that, that I know it's going to be there. And, and you notice when I'm, when I'm practicing, if I'm sitting down, the bass sits right here and you, and you do all your stuff with it. And when you stand up, it's in the same spot. So you're always used to it being at the same spot in your body. Whether you like it high or low is your own personal preference, but as long as it's on the same spot, if you're practicing, and then move, all your angles change, everything moves. So uh, I, I like to uh, try to encourage people to get at one spot that they're going to put the bass and leave it and then work on everything from there. So it's just real important for me. I, I see a lot of players, you know, reaming away in the, in the dressing rooms, get up on stage and the bass is in a completely different spot and they can't do it. And they come back, you know, blaming their roadie or their amp or whatever, you know. It's usually, surprisingly enough, just to get your... Uh, strap in the right spot is really important. You've mentioned in the past having the fewest possible variables. Yeah. This is really an extension of that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's, it's the first variable, really, uh, where the base is. You know, once it's in position on your body, and then worry about getting your arms close to it, and then you're down to your elbows and wrists, and then eventually to your fingertips. But it all bases up that one solid spot. And it sounds ridiculously stupid and, and elementary, but it's really important a lot and of people... Maybe easily ignored, huh? Yeah, that's probably why. A lot of fundamental things are easily ignored. What about things like action and the, the feeling of the fingers on the strings? How should you adjust your action, ideally, for optimum performance? Well, it's hard for a, for a beginning player because they don't know what's right or wrong yet because they haven't had the experience of doing it. But I generally set my action to the point where it buzzes and then lift it up from there, down to where it buzzes and lift it up from there. If you can get a good repairman, he can hone your neck down and, and do a job on your fret so you can get the action really low and uh, have it not buzz at all. But uh, I, I get it pretty low and then, again, as I said, raise it up so it's, so it's not flopping around and buzzing, because it's a happy medium. You can set up the bass for perfect studio tone where you get no buzz or rattle at all. Or for me, it's pretty ratty all the time because I'm more of a live player, of course, than a studio player. So um, mine is a little buzzy and rattling, but I personally prefer that because uh, like uh, Chris Squire's tone and roundabout that grind and yeah. grind is great. You know, that's, that's, you know, you hear some character in there, some noise. Uh, to me, you know, playing a rock and roll band is about as far from perfection as you could get. <laughs> so, you know, a little noise is, actually adds to it, I think. What about string spacing, the distance between the strings? Well, it's pretty, for action. usually they're not very adjustable, but I, I wish companies would stick with standards. There should be a basic Fender and a basic Gibson spacing because that's the two bases that pretty much started out everything so the the as a matter of fact on, on this base here the gibson spacing you can see is is um you know the strings are, are outside of its spacing that's the standard gibson spacing where the fender spacing where these demarzio pickups are made um you know they're right in on that so it's a little off on here but uh Wider spaced strings um give your fingers a chance to get in between if you're a finger player it's real important right now, what about string tension itself? How does that affect technique, the tension of the strings? Well, um, however tight the strings are determines how much they're going to flap around and buzz on the fretboard. I would discourage anyone from using a real light set of strings because, uh, you know, bass is a real strength instrument. It takes a lot of strength to play it, more so than a guitar. And um, I prefer to encourage people to put as much into it to get as much out, use a real strength kind of point of view. Could you tell us a little bit about your development in the early years as a player, what you got from your early influences? Well, um, first major influence probably was the Yardbirds, Paul Samuel Smith. So. Great bass solos, great bass tones. I forgot the idea for the EVO style pickup. Ah. Um, super deep low end, I'm a man, ra having a rave up with the Yardbirds, totally great plan. One of the early prototype heavy bands too. Oh yeah, totally great. Real metal if you wanted to call it that, that metal and mono <laughs> i guess you'd call it but uh, it was great uh him and then uh you know the beatles and all the pop british invasion came through all the songs mccartney melodic sense yeah M mccartney is a way way over um looked bass player way underrated uh, like you know, mm -hmm. all the rain stuff yeah. and you know it's great stuff 
really cool, great tones too. Really, really built the band. And a lot of what you see now in bass players for the whole song, it's just really, bass just wasn't like that back then. Motown, Jamie Jamerson, all over the place. A fundamental element of the song is a bass line. Right. Move, move the whole song. It made the whole song happen. So that's stuff I kind of grew up on, things that really were uh, an important part of the song bass parts that were part, part of the song, not soloing or not just thudding along, you know, eighth notes on the, you know, along with the single disco beat yeah. bass drum, you know, there's, there's a lot more happening back then as far as, you know, writing goes. Then I got into, uh, uh, Tim Bogart was, was probably yeah. my biggest real big bass influence, Tim Bogart. Uh, from Vanilla Fudge. And he influenced you technically too, didn't Yeah, you? real, real technically. Um, he was, uh, he's still my hero. He's the greatest. I got all my raking techniques from him. I think the, the bass he played on uh, the first Vanilla Fudge record to this day has set the standard for the ability of a bass to move in the context of a song and just take it to places yeah. where it just wouldn't have gone without him, you know. It's really incredible. Jack Bruce, Cream, unbelievable. All the live stuff. Um, I just did an interview with him together. Uh, recently for a, a magazine cover and uh, for a big article story about, you know, bass back then and now. And right. It's real interesting to hear his point of view on three-piece bands and stuff and how much the bass is really a part of things, you know. That's what I, I identify a lot with what he said. Oh, absolutely. That. We were like right on the money, mm -hmm. both uh, kind of the same thing. It was pretty cool. And he was a great voice and a great songwriter. Totally amazing. John Entwistle, Chris mm -hmm. Squire. You know, you name them. Did you know. the sound of roto sounds come from Chris Square? Yeah, Chris Square. Chris, Chris well, uh, actually, it was, I came more from uh, John Entwistle, I think, for me. But when Chris Square came out, he, he popularized it for everybody. That grinding bass tone, yeah. totally cool. He's a great player. Um, but uh, uh, a guy in my neighborhood that started me playing bass, Joe Hesse, he actually gave me my first set of roto sounds. He used set off his bass, and once hmm. I tried them, like back in 1971, I think it was, once I put them on, I couldn't try anything else again, you know, so that was how long I've been playing them. So, uh, well, that's kind of where that, that tone came from. But um, and other than that, you know, Jocko and then sure. everything. You know, Oscar Peterson piano I used to listen to a lot. Sonny Rollins, jazz sax player, Herbie Mann. Yeah. Um, Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa heavily. All my all my seven four and five four. Yeah. Learning odd time signatures, and he was the king of that. You know, so I learned a lot. I, I can you know from memory sing you. Uh, you know, his whole first uh, ten records, you know, <laughs> me and Steve Vai on the, on the tour bus on the, on the first Dave tour, we'd, we could sing uh, every Frank Zappa song there was with every little nuance, it was funny. So we learned a lot of that, and um, that's about everything. Anything in music is an influence. Um, Including things like Bach even, right? Yeah, well, Bach, Bach I got into real heavily very, very early on, way early 70s, and Everybody's like it's a buzzword now. I listen to classical music, and I said, uh, you know, I'd, I'd much rather go listen to something that no one else is listening to. You know, like pedal steel guitar or mm -hmm. ethnic music, something that not everybody's into. Because I've always, as a player, I've always tried to go towards something different than what everyone else was doing, and it's been successful for me so far. So I, I, I continue that instead of going with how everyone else is being influenced, go somewhere else. You know. <laughs> What have you done over the years to make your bass unique? Um, well, with my Fender bass, this is basically an, an imitation of the Fender. The Fender is so beat uh, over the years. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll show you here. This Fender um, is so beat, I'm always worried about it not making it to the next gig sometimes because it's just been through. This is all, all this, like, this is the only finish left on the poor thing, <laughs> you know. And uh, as far as what I've done to it over the years, I've just played so long, so many times, so many hot, sweaty nights that um, the bass kind of wears into you. So now when I get a new bass, like the Yamaha, I have to mimic all the wear on the new bass. So on this here, remember I was talking about the th position for your thumb? Yes. That's natural wear into the pickguard. It's a multi-layered Fender pickguard, right. so that's all natural wear. If you can see, uh, there's wear spots here, here, mm -hmm. all along here. It's all wear from where my thumb goes all along, you know. So I've, like, worn this thing into, you know, worn it out, practically, you know. So it's, and I get used to an instrument. It's a good, good idea for uh, players when, when you're starting out to 
pick an instrument and stick with it because mm -hmm. you'll find your body starts to shape out. Right now, if I just stand up, my ribs go in on this side from this base <laughs> being up against me. My, uh, my shoulder goes down on the left from holding it, so my body's you know, permanently uh, you know, crippled from, my, from my holding on to a 30 pounds of fender bass for so long, whatever. But uh, so it really, you really fit into it. It becomes such a natural part of you after a while. So to change basses, get a new bass is very tough to do. So anything I do to the instrument, I try to mimic on my new instruments what happened naturally to my Fender after years and years and years of playing. So um, I knew that was going to happen. And uh, so now on this bass, uh, basically, it it I've used this for all the recording I've done recently, and I've used it a little bit live. Mm -hmm. But it's so hard to get used to anything different than the Fender. Right. So what I've done with this bass to, to get it more closer um, to, to what I like, I've actually worn down here with a little Moto tool. I faked the actual wear, wear there, so it, it, it feels the same. Uh -huh. um, and basically, I had to take like 600 grit sandpaper and just take all the shine off, because if it's too shiny, it's too slippery. Right. But that bass is like bare wood, so it just sticks on my body. I've had to like put this tape and stuff on there to make it Traction. Feel. Yeah, give it to you, like, you know, the stuff you put on your bathtub so you don't slip yeah. and things like that, you know. And uh, just wear it down and make it feel worn in. Cause, you uh, scalp the fretboard and things like that, too, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I started to scalp this one, but I was mm -hmm. on my way to Japan under the auspices of Yamaha, and I didn't want to beat their, their beautiful bass. They were kind uh -huh. enough to give me two beds, so I, I ended up not doing my homespun uh, uh, scalloping job that I did annihilate my fender with. So, so that's, uh, I will do it, though. The purpose of that is when you do that high bends. You get a little more yeah, you bend. Get, you get a little of the wood out of the way there, and ah. it tends to when your when your hands are hot and sweaty or whatever, you tend to catch up on that wood a little bit. So, uh, so that's what that's for. But basically, I just wear the thing down. What about your detuner? Um, yeah, this uh, hip shot detuner, great little deal. Um, uh, for years, I uh, used to tune down to low D live, you know, and. Uh, you have to tune in between while the singer's trying to say something, you know, or something in the dead air there. All people are streaming out of the bar, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, but I saw an ad for this in one of the guitar magazines, and uh, uh, it's, it's like, you know, came, fell from the heavens. Perfect, exactly what I needed. Uh, so it's a real simple device. It just takes your, um, your, your um, tuning key and mounts it on a little thing that you can just you flip it. It just moves the whole thing down so you don't change the tuning at all. It stays right in. Drop it down a low D, back to an E. Works, you know, perfect right into it. Back up to the E. So it works great. Um, if you got to make sure and pull the string really super tightly. That's when I put my strings on. I always torque them down on that tuning key with all my strength, pulling each one as hard as I can, so that as you're playing and bending strings, you're not going to pull yourself out of tune. I see guys playing a lot and bending strings, and uh, halfway through the night, the bass is hopelessly out of tune. So I always keep it torqued as heavy as I can. When I put a new set of strings on, I tune them up extra sharp, let them sit for a while, then tune them back down, and squeeze them and pull them as hard as possible before they break, you know, just to make sure they're all worked in good. So when I go up on stage and play, I almost never have a tuning problem. You know, I almost never break a string. I haven't broken a string for probably about uh, six or seven years now. Actually, used use properly, they won't break. You know. This is a special set of strings for you, too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I think they're going to actually make a, some kind of Billy Sheehan uh, deal set or something. I don't know. But, uh, but this is my suggestion, I, and they, they seem excited about it, so I think they're going to actually package it up. It's basically a standard set of rotosound strings, but the G is a little bit lighter, and the E is a little bit heavier. Uh, it evens the tension out, gives you a nice, big, fatter, heavier low end, which right. all bass players could probably use. And if you tune down to a low D, because you're, the, the E string is a little bit heavier, the tension stays there. It doesn't flop around yeah. as much. And uh, I, again, on the G, you tend to, mm -hmm. it's, it makes it a little easier to bend. And since the G is usually way tighter than the other strings right. on a bass, this evens out the tension a little bit more. So it really makes it, uh, makes it even across the neck. really helps your right-hand technique out. It does for me. So yeah. hopefully they'll put it together and you know, do, do a package, package a set of strings like that, yeah. What about your pickups and harm actual electronics in the guitar? Uh, all passive. I don't use any active stuff because every time you've got an active thing, you're always wondering, is it the battery? Yeah. You know, is something, you know, the... Fused variables. Yeah, exactly, because you never know. It's distorting a little bit. It doesn't sound quite like it did last night. 
Maybe it's the battery, you know, it's always, because you never know. And you become Somehow they put a brand junkie. new battery in, but for some reason it lost, you know, you never know. So it's that one mystery that I hate having. So it's always um, uh, passive electronics. DiMarzio pickups, I've used DiMarzio's for years. It's just loud, good sounding, fat, honking pickup. Uh, straight to a volume control out. Uh, my bass has two outputs, as you see. Um, one is for the DiMarzio output, and the other one is for the... Uh, I use either a DiMarzio Model 1 or an old Gibson EBO humbucker, big, fat, super low-end bass. So I run two amps, one clean, uh, or one super deep low-end and one high-end, so I can mix between high and low on the bass. That's okay. making an awfully long story short, but it's... Trust me, and it basically, remember the old Rickenbacker bass that sure. had a stereo jack, Rickle, Rickle sound. sound. Yeah, yeah, that's the same principle. But back in, um, I think it was 1970. One, I actually put my first humbucker on there, so it's mm. been around for a long time. So yeah. it actually works out because the humbucker, a uh, low end pickup, is the best super deep low end, and the Fender style DiMarzo here in this case is uh, covers everything else. You have the best of both worlds on that. And you also have a nice place to rest your thumb. Yeah, it's it's good thumb rest thing. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> right. What words of wisdom could you give to aspiring bass players who want to be known as bass players for the 90s. What, what, uh, what play you tell them? Find a live, real human being drummer and sit down and, and work with them and work out songs. And I, I know it's tough these days to play out clubs because there aren't as many clubs that were when I was coming up. But um, if you play live everywhere and anywhere. We played, I played bank openings, uh, football practices for the grocery Buffalo stores. Bills. Uh, never any grocery stores, <laughs> fortunately. Um, uh, fashion shows, pr millions of proms. You know, proms, you had to like two slow songs. When you got those, the rest of the night, everybody's like sweating, throwing yeah. their tuxedos aside, you know, going nuts. So we played everything, you know. It was just a great experience to learn things. Now, when I get out on stage, it's a big stage, there's millions of lights, you know, something goes wrong, anything happens, <laughs> I've, I've been there. I've done it a million times, you know, so it's, it's much easier to handle. And to see uh, young players be able to get that kind of experience is the thing I would really like to see best, you know. It's, that's most important. You Any see suggestions it. for how they could do that? Just lock in with a live band? Yeah, live band. And you have to make a, a lot live? Yeah. Uh, well, I learned most everything I do live, on stage in front of people. I didn't really sit home and figure it out. It all came like from a bolt from the blue. I learned about modes on stage. I was in Pittsburgh playing at this club called Stage One years ago, and, uh, and a friend of mine had taught me about the modes, but I didn't understand what the... I didn't get the deal. Uh, wh what does he mean by modes and this position? All of a sudden, <coughs> oh, and all of a sudden the fretboard just exploded like... Yeah. Like, the significance of it, the, you know, it looked like this big. It's, oh, now I see, you know, right there, right live on, on the, you know, in front of people. I actually figured out, you know, finally, <laughs> a little bit about music, you know. So, um, you know, to get up in front of people is, is, is the essential thing, you know. And I, it's sad that you can't do it, but you gotta, you gotta get a band that does something that people will dig. You gotta know how to appeal to people. And I think a lot of bands sound like it's so original, they're not worried about appealing to people, they're worried about getting a record deal. You Initially, know, as a bass player, though, if they were just to get with a drummer and work with a drummer. Yeah, Would that be a good enough start? That's, that's totally where it's at. And uh, listen, cop things off records. Listen to great bass players now. I mean, a uh, uh, guy from ACDC or Judas Priest, may, may, maybe unsung heroes, but those guys laid down great, all the funk stuff. Great, great, amazing. I mean, that's the groove, the, the rhythm and, and feel and groove to get, you know. Cop that. But uh, so much stuff nowadays um, is, is a little bit stiff. That's why I would recommend sitting down with a drummer, you know, a real live guy. <laughs> Your right hand technique is really well developed. What can you tell us about your right hand plucking approach? Well, the, um, that's the most important thing for uh, fingerstyle bass players, your right hand technique. And the most overlooked aspect of it is having a great spot to anchor your thumb, a great and permanent, well-known spot to <laughs> have your thumb at all times. So Home that, base, uh, huh? yes, exactly, all puns intended. And um, uh, what I do, many, many years, I started off in the Fender bass, which is the basic Fender precision bass pickup position here, these dual split little guys. And I always have my, my thumb right in here, uh, which dampens the, now I have it touching the bass, and then up against the uh, pickup itself, and then also up against the E string. 
which dampens the E string. So with your So you're always, your E isn't going to be humming along while you're doing anything. That cleans up the sound too a bit. Oh yeah. And when you're playing really loud and everything's feeding back, you got to hang on every string with, for dear life so it doesn't get out of control. And the other split place I uh, put my thumb is uh, right on the next pick up here, which dampens the A string. So when you're... That nothing else is sounding. Actually, the other part of my thumb is dampening the E string too, so I got them both down. And occasionally I'll even get up to there <laughs> and put my, my thumb on the pickup itself for just the G string playing. But uh, the important point is, is to have a spot for your thumb, whether it be one spot or several spots. I'm just used to that from traveling around over the years. Um, whenever I do anything, I always have my thumb anchored on the bass. Any like hammer on stuff on the... Always anchored here. It's actually starting to wear the paint down on this <laughs> bass here. Always have a solid point from which to work. And I keep my wrist locked real solidly. Um, some instructor was telling some kids the other day to always leave your wrists loose and floating over the instrument. The problem with that is when you're on a 60-foot stage running a full blast in front of 20,000 people, the monitors are feeding back, yeah. people are throwing stuff, you're going to try to uh, play delicately floating, it ain't going to happen. You know, it's not going to work. It's, you're going to fall on your face, basically. So. Um, I, I really need to lock my arm down on the bass, my thumb in the spot, my wrist locked, and my fingers work. The difference between uh, some players that I see uh, work from this knuckle, uh -huh. where I work from that knuckle there. And the reason for that, you'll see some movement in there, but that's more for positioning. The reason for that is when your finger sweeps like that, it creates a radius about that size. I see. And when you sweeps like that, the radius is much smaller. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that smaller radius fits in between the strings better, so you can actually play one string without hitting every other string while making a sweep. Some, some players play uh, like that. Stand-up players play like that. Mm -hmm. You also notice stand-up players uh, ha have a spot for the thumb. It's on exactly. the side of the neck. Yes. And that's how they, that's how they play. I watched a guy the other night playing stand-up bass. He has his thumb locked down there real solidly, and he's got his spot. And on a stand-up bass, there's not too much difference in how any of them are built. It's the bridge thing and the neck and, and the, the fingerboard extension over the body, and they're all like that. The problem with electric bass is many manufacturers, everybody makes one different. Different configuration. Yeah, so you get, never got a good spot for your thumb. That's why I make all my basses with this, uh, make sure they got the old Fender style pickups on them, or I can't really ever play them live, you know, even if it's a real cool custom bass, I have to make them put these pickups in it in order for me to play. Uh -huh. So in other words, um, getting back to where, we're, where we started from, uh, wrist lock, thumb in a good spot, work from this angle, basically, mm -hmm. is, is how I pluck. And there's even a little bit of technology to how the, the finger goes over, um, over the string. As you tighten this joint, your, your plucking will become harder because you're, you're, you're digging into it harder. Right. Or you can leave it loose and let it float over, like for raking techniques. Like that. See. see, when you're raking across, these are sliding across. This, right. this joint here is actually pretty loose, and it's just kind of like working its way across. Now, if you want to play harder, you tighten that joint up. Aha. So it's like your tension control. Right. Dynamics control. Yeah. Too. Dynamic tension even. Hey, why not do both, you know? But uh, yeah, that's the, so that's, that's kind of the workings of the joint, how, how, I, how I use it. Now I do a finger exercise sometimes just to make sure I'm really using that part of the joint, was, which is uh, just uh, trying to hold your hand completely still, your fingers completely still, and just work from that joint up one finger at a time without the other ones moving. And it's great at, at parties too if you want to do uh, drinking bets and to see That's people. True. No one can ever do it really. Well, once you, it's actually pretty easy, but then you do twos and different groups of them and whatever. But it's just a good way to uh, exercise your hand, keeping stiff from, from here to here, totally stiff, mm -hmm. and then just working from those joints there. Now, you'll see me when I'm playing, of course, there, I violate those rules all right. over the place, but that's basically what it comes from. You know, it's using, using that, that joint like that for three fingers.
Exactly. Now, your main approach is a three-finger approach. Right. Could you describe some of those details for us? Well, um, since most Western music is in four, to get four out of three, you have to, um, when you're plucking, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, if you're, you're going to do four, one lands on a different finger each right. time. Now, there's, uh, there's a little controversy on which way to go when you're plucking. Should you go this way? Some guys want to go back and forth. But um, if you're sitting at the dentist office and you're nervous, your n natural hands are going to fall th in that direction. It yeah. seems to be that that's the natural way that your fingers move. So therefore, that's the natural... Natural law of physics, almost. Yeah, kind of the, the law of hand physics, anyway. Right. You know, whatever whatever book that was in. But that's um, that's kind of why I eventually got to that direction. Uh, to go in the other direction, sometimes I will for exercise. Anytime I do anything, I'll always exercise it backwards, forwards, sideways, do it every conceivable way, even in ways that I normally wouldn't do it, just to exercise my muscles around so I'm not stuck in one particular pattern. So. Um, I'm going in this direction. The reason I'm not going back and forth like that right. is because the middle finger then works twice as much. So it's one, two, one, two, one, two. It works twice as much on each passage back and forth. Uh, again, that is a good exercise to do. To learn back and forth. But I always tend to go in that direction. So therefore, if you're going to go in that direction with three fingers to do four, it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So in other words, one starts on a different finger each time. Exactly, it's alternation. So it's, exactly. One, two, three, four. Now I'll, I'll, I start always, incidentally, with uh, my ring finger. Uh -huh. Some guys, uh, I guess if you're going the other way, you would start with your index would finger. Would that be considered your heaviest attack finger? Yeah. You know, I, I guess. I guess I would consider it that way. But um, uh, so when I start with that finger, uh, that's one, so it's one, two, three, four. Now the next finger, the middle finger, begins one. One, two, three, four, and that ends you up perfectly for your index finger to take the next one. One, two, three, four. So it's... Mm -hmm. So when you're getting real fast and stuff, you will hear three in there if you listen closely, but when I get my live calluses and stuff back, <laughs> you, um, you probably won't, you know. It would be so loud you can't tell anyway. But, but um, that's, that's kind of the trick of, of playing fast with three. Now you can do with a lot of two-finger techniques out there. Um, Jeff Berlin plays two-finger right. technique. Unbelievable. I mean, he, the last thing he needs is another finger, you know. So. <laughs> but um, uh, with, with a three, for me, it tends to be easier. You know, Iron Maid, you know. That galloping kind of thing exactly. for heavy metal style stuff. It works good for that, you know, because that's all in threes or groups of threes. But um, some guys don't need it. But for me, I, I prefer the three finger technique. So, uh, but there there is plenty of valid two fingers that use. And when I do use two fingers, I usually use these two because index and ring. Yeah, because these two are the most are actually the most even of the two or of the five here. Left a few out. Um, and, uh, and that's one thing I left out also. When you work from that joint, you even up the flatness. See, when you, when you, you have your fingers like this, this finger sticks way out. As soon as you change them, um, you, get, you get a totally flat surface there and it makes it easier so that one doesn't stick out over the other. Right, so it's actually, it's funny because of all this stuff you'd think, you know, I've spent years figuring this out and then did it, but in actual fact I did it for years without knowing, having a clue as to what it was. So it all kind of developed totally natural by feel, by what feel, felt natural to me to play. What actually felt right when I was up on stage when I wasn't thinking about you know, what my fingers were doing is the last thing you would ever think about on stage. But it all came about from just playing over years and years and years. And then later on, like when I go now, like to Musicians Institute, and somebody asks me a question, I got to stop and think, and gee, how do I do that? So I, it's actually, I've learned all this stuff after the fact, yeah. in other words. So that's the reason why I brought that up, I want you to think that I was, you know, figuring all this stuff out and then applying it, because right. I'm certainly nowhere near that smart. So. It came through practice, actual live experience. Yeah, live. Uh, practicing that I've done I usually doesn't have too much to do with anything other than finger exercises. Mm -hmm. Live playing is where I've learned all my hammering techniques and everything. They're all thought up and done right on stage live, you know, which is kind of the best place, you know, trial by fire, more right. or less. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it for the right hand, I think. Oh, sometimes I use four fingers, but that little finger never gets a quite good enough callus on it, so it, it catches, so you'll hear it in there. What about raking strings technique? Yeah, that's another, um, 
right-handed technique. And uh, what that consists of basically of when you rake, rake fingers across, similar to a garden rake, which is probably where they got the name from. Exactly. Actually, I didn't know what it was called until Tim Bogart, who I stole the idea from when I, in my early days. Tim, well, and as well now, he's my total hero on bass. And he did tons of raking techniques. And, and when I first started bass and listened to him, I realized that I had to be a finger player because there's no way you could do those on w with a pick. Those sweeping techniques are popular yeah. now, and they're very close to it, but there's still a lot of things you can do raking that you can't do with a pick. So I stole it from Tim Bogart, so I had, had to give him credit for that. But um, it's basically a way to slip your fingers over the strings and get a whole bunch of notes out of just one pass because your fingers are staggered, uh -huh. and they, they kind of catch at different times. So you get that... Now that particular move there, that's a four finger, one, two, one, two, one, two. So we can really get some wailing, you know, a whole bunch of flailing notes coming out of there like that. Um, this seems like a good way to build right hand speed. Yeah, well, the speediest things I do are probably the raking stuff, mm -hmm. you know, because there's just so many notes whip by. If I ever had to go back and transcribe and figure out what it was, I, I'm doomed, you know, because I don't even know what, know what half the notes are that sneak by there. But, but that's, uh, that's, that's, that's definitely one of the secrets of getting a lot of speed out of the instrument, if that's your goal, to be a speedy player. But it also adds a fluidity to your speed, right. because things are flowing and raking and, and being pulled across in the same direction and stuff like that. And, and it makes, uh, speed for speed's sake is pointless, but uh, if it's fluid and musical. Exactly, which in is context. Where, yeah, w which is where raking kind of comes in. It, it makes it a little bit more musical, uh, more rhythmic. <laughs> Stuff like that. Would you say between the three finger technique, the raking, and then the four finger, you have your basic favorite right hand patterns? Yeah. Do you use 90% um, of the time? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I do is the tapping stuff, which, right. you know, that's, that's, that's another story. But yeah, that's basically it. The most important thing for, for anybody, I think, is that locked, thumb locked strap <laughs> length, you know, all those little crazy things that you would never think all of. All little variables. Yeah, locked in there, good spot, hands in the right position, playing with a lot of strength to get a really good, strong, hard, solid callus, because that'll have a lot to do with the tone of your playing. Uh -huh. So however hard your fingertip is, is how easy it slips over the strings. I always, always have used rotosound sound strings, and they're very rough strings. They're tough. Tough on the frets, but for tone, I, 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 can't, I can't play anything else, really. And um, they grab your finger real well. So there's a real... You know, as a real catch to it, so it's a yes. percussive attack at the note. Now, pick bass players got a, an advantage because they can you know get their attack from that pick sound. Exactly. Where finger plays, you got to get a big, you know, hard, solid callus to kind of mimic that, you know, and give you that attack. Producers will, will drive you crazy and like ask you to play with a pick if you don't have it. So, warning in advance, uh, make sure you get that callus up there and save yourself some trouble later. What can you tell us about recovery muscles? Um, most of your moves you do on bass have to do with pulling your hands in uh, towards your thumbs, towards the thumb on the back of the neck. Mm -hmm. You're pushing down on the strings to push them up against the frets, or you're plucking up towards your thumb when you're plucking from the right hand. So it's all that pull muscle. You almost never see anyone working on the muscle to get your finger back into the position where it can pull again. And that's the whole idea of, of exercising recovery muscles. In other words, it's not the muscle that you use to pull in. It's a muscle you use to push out. So it's some kind of rubber band thing somebody sent me one time that you can exercise your hands with. But you'll find if you, if you, you, know, if you like push up against, try to push, lift your finger up and oppose against it like that. Yes. And each finger you'll find is very, very weak, where down, of course, is very strong. So if you exercise that muscle, you'll find that 50% of your moves is recovery to get to the next move. So when you press down on a note, you got to lift up to get to the next note. When it comes to doing something fast, you're going to have to get up and down fast. So you're going to find that by exercising your recovery muscle, as crazy as it might seem, it actually helps a lot in your speed and accuracy and uh, the fluidity of your hands. This is just a thing that came out of nowhere one time, and I started working on my recovery muscles, and I found that every time I did, uh, my playing took you know, a leap into a little bit more 
uh, exactness and a little less slop that, that, that I normally have a lot of. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, the recovery muscles is kind of a, it, people always, that's one of the things that gets overlooked easily. And a trill would be a good way to develop that? Yeah, you could, or just put your finger on there and oppose it and push up against it a bit so that you're, you know, pushing against your finger there a little bit. You know, you've played with some of the greatest technical players, guitar-wise, of our time, you know, in a close band situation or touring. Where do you think technique is going for the 90s? It's been developed heavily in the 80s. Well, what do you I think it's going to happen? I think it's, it's peaked and it's reached total overkill to the point where it's technique for technique's sake, which is a total waste and total, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a horrible situation for music to be in. Because I come from a song era, song playing, you know, the, you know, Three Dog Night, Young Rascals, all these bands had great songs, and that's the stuff I play. always played in a band that had a lot of vocals in my early mm -hmm. days. And so songwriting to me is really essential. So, I, so now a lot of songs are built around just technique, technique, technique. Well, let's find a song where we can fit all this in because we want everybody to hear this technique. It's just like, you know, you know, uh, the new band I have, Mr. Big, we're, we're, we're writing things exactly the opposite. We're writing a song, getting a piece of music down that's really you know, where we think it's at, and then adding playing to it, you know, because that's right. how my playing evolved. We go out and play, you know, Three Dog Night songs, Joy to the World, and early days of bar band copy tunes, and, uh, you know, we'd be flying all over the place in them, you know, and having fun with it, because you, once you've got a good song, a good foundation, then you take off. It's gone the opposite nowadays, and I just think a lot of people have kind of lost touch with that, because everybody's wowed by the new the hot kid on the block, yeah. and that's real cool, but... Um, you know, it's, it really doesn't have the dimension and the staying power that a song does. A song is everything. Do you feel also that as a musician it's important to have a lot of song repertoire in your background? Oh, yeah. To create and to improvise better and yeah, to feel again, comfortable? Everybody, when I was playing in a bar band for so many years, we used to get these elitists that talk about playing original material. You've got to be original and be original. Well, we, always, we were always a copy band. But as it turns out, that was like, you know, the Beatles. <laughs> yeah. There was an original bone in their bodies, you know, when they when they first, you know, started. They were playing all the servicemen's club in Germany yeah. and they even their first record was a bunch of copy tunes sure. on it. Please Mr. Postman, oh, Twist God. and oh, Shout, yeah. all that stuff. Roll over Beethoven. Yeah, and that's where they that's where you really get your chops. Just like you learn other people's solos mm -hmm. by learning other people's songs and playing and performing and getting an audience to react to them. That's where you learn you know the basis everybody talks so much about technique and all these things. Um why, why are we doing it? Are we doing right. it to, to solo for the rest of our lives? We're doing it to get up in front of people and perform and make something happen with an audience or have a record that, that touches many people. And you're not going to do that necessarily with lots of soloing. You're going to do that with a song. And, and the whole purpose of being in music for me is to get up on stage and entertain people. And yes. It's not necessarily just sit there and solo all night long. That's crazy. So many people get into that too much now. And it's just, I think if people just kind of focused on their real goal in music, um, which should be to be up in front of people performing, you know, doing something that's going to touch a lot of people and have a common ground between you and a lot of other people. I think then you get back to songwriting, you know. So um, Communication. You know, yeah, absolutely. So in the old days of playing in bars, we had to make our living by getting people in the bar, mm. staying all night, buying drinks, picking up girls, whatever they did, but they had to get there and stay there. And the only way we did that was by playing the best songs we could find from every band doing the best way possible. And that was like the best training ground ever. It has a lot to do with my playing, uh, my techniques, my, my whole point of view because as I said the foundation of it is not soloing a technique you know and unfortunately uh, it's it's bad that guitar has gone that way but it's it'll be even worse if more bass players do that I feel in a lot of ways have created some monsters out there and <laughs> that uh, a lot of guys the first thing they pick up the bass they start doing hammer it's great it's really neat but um, if out of 500 bands that you could conceivably get in maybe 10 of them you'll be able to take a solo in of those 10 maybe uh, 20 or 30 seconds. So here's guys devoting their whole lives to all this stuff. Well, they'll actually only be able to do 20 or 30 seconds of it live ever, you know? And what about the groove? That's where it's at. I mean, that's, you know, I, I learned about playing drums. I used to, um, in the old bands, used to rehearse with just the drummer alone. We used to learn all our songs and just going just bass and drums. Just, you know, no guitar, no vocals, just learning grooves, learn how to work with drums, pound along with them, stay in time. And uh, we always had to get audiences dancing in the early days, so we always had to make it move. We always had to make it groove and slide, and we were always really successful. Uh, tell us back in Buffalo, like we held every attendance record at every club. They stopped, they stopped counting after a while, you know. It was like for over a decade, or from 72 to 80. 
five. I mean, Talos was around in Buffalo, so we, you know, we, we, we certainly cut our, you know, cut our teeth on that. A principle that I use with my left hand that I began or noticed first on my right hand is that principle of locking things together. Um, uh, my, my hand, you know, once it's, I actually use kind of uh, my index finger as like a bar and I work everything off of that. Like it's always clamped on there. Um, uh, my finger always has like two calluses, you know, one for, for like it covers two strings, sometimes three strings. Um, uh, lock my hand on so that um, as it falls onto the base, automatically you cover four frets uh, with four fingers like that. So that's your standard position, um, always locked in there. Uh, sometimes my thumb is on top, sometimes it's behind. I'm never sure which is really right or not. Pursuing that, would it be pretty useful to use a chromatic scale to develop your left hand? Yeah. Um, What's a chromatic scale? <laughs> no, Four notes in a row. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that I do uh, as, as an exercise. You can do that backwards, forwards, start it from the middle, out. Or, or, or stagger it. Any configuration you can think of. But what I do basically is exercise my fingers so that um, any combination is is worked out in exercise and you and also I do exercising without my right hand sometimes because you'll find if occasionally you do an exercise with it with just one hand independently right hand alone or left hand alone you understand if you watch your playing sometimes you'll notice that your left hand will cover for your right and vice versa you can like focus the, maybe more as you separate them too yeah I focus on who, who's doing what whereas they cover for each other's mistakes kind of if your left hand is weak in an area your right hand will kind of beef up the, right. the, the move there to to, to make up for it. So what I try to do sometimes, not all the time because you lose your coordination between hands, but uh, work on my left hand alone just to make sure I see what it's doing. You can feel the weak spots in it, especially when you do exercises like that are across playing all those notes. I feel, I, you know, this is definitely the weaker finger, so I definitely feel that. So I, I'll work on that across the neck like that. Th this. And, and again, I, I play mostly in patterns, so right. uh, th this is the pattern, all, all four fingers across all four strings on four frets. Now you notice that when you're actually playing mu music, you're going to have to get up to a uh, stretch like that. Of course. You probably actually wouldn't, in most music, you'd never stretch more than that, really, than four, than uh, however many frets that is, <laughs> five frets or whatever it is. Um, so uh, that, that's where it comes into play, how I actually... Um, musically what I play. I've concentrated mostly in, uh, as we've been talking about what to play because it's pretty much my philosophy. I'd really not show people uh, notes, you know, show them the notes that, you know, and scales. You can get that out of any book. Bach wrote it all down yes. 100 years ago, 200 years ago, so there's really no point in me going over what scales because I really don't know them anyway, but what I concentrate in mostly is just my hands and how they work, so that's kind of what the, the purpose of all this is. And the thing I do for my right hand is I basically do, in all my musical playing, there's only three patterns. I'm a pattern player, and there's only three patterns. The first pattern is two whole step. Whole step, whole step. The next pattern is a whole step and a half step. And the other pattern, third, next, is a half step and a whole step. So that's all three patterns of major scale. Right. So whenever you're playing a major scale, those three patterns will be in there. And so if you practice and exercise those three patterns in every conceivable manner on one string, it would stand to reason, theoretically, that you could eventually parlay that into being able to play any scale anywhere with fluidity. Covering all the modes and yeah. all the diatonic possibilities. Well, there they really go with the, the, those music words again there. Di well, diatonic meaning meaning just a normal seven note scale like a major scale yeah, generating okay. all the modes that go I'm with it. I'm not even kidding, I really don't know what that means, but I know I'll probably play some diatonic stuff Absolutely. here. Absolutely. 
I played uh, some diatomaceous stuff here earlier. <laughs> but what basically we're doing, here's the, here's the two patterns. I'll show how it works. Here's the two patterns. There's one of them. Right. That's the other one. Now, whenever I do a scale, like a C major or a G major scale, actually it only goes. Right, before I'll, you hit the octave. Right, but I'll extend it across all notes that I can play of that scale in that position. So that would include that F right. sharp. So that's all the notes of the G major scale in, in that, that position. position, exactly. Yes. So then you move up to that. That's the other pattern of the exactly. two whole steps. It's all the all of that one. Did I do anything diatonic yet? They're all diatonic. You're on safe ground. And that's back have. to an octave higher. Exactly. So if you if you notice, if you want to, you know, whoever is watching this or runs, puts their tape in reverse or whatever, only three patterns were included in all those. Right. Var various groupings of those patterns, but they're all two whole steps, whole step and a half step, half step and a whole step. That's exactly. all that there is. And it's funny that of all the music, all Western music, which is in basically a major scale, or even the minor key, which is a relative minor, I know right. about that a little bit, yeah. that, that, it's, that it all, it's only those three patterns. Mm -hmm. Until you get into like harmonic minors and right. then With other the odd intervals in it. Odd scales that, yes. you know, that, that odd people probably think of. So. What about your rocking on the bar technique that you use with your left rocking hand? Rocking on the bar thing. I used to do that when I was in an old band. We played in the bars and we'd always get out on the bar. And, no, just kidding. <laughs> rocking on the bar technique. That sounds like uh, something a band would do in a bar. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we're actually referring to there is um, uh, it's kind of a barring technique. Instead of so you actually play with this part of your finger. So you cover, the, the, the string is on the tip and, the, and then this middle part. So we've got to get us a little snap of that joint. So that little hula dance kind of thing there. It's like a hinge almost, isn't it? Yeah. Or, or a collapsing kind of effect. Yeah, so... Uh, it's real handy to just get more notes. So again, economy of motion. So you're not moving and using fingers more than you have to, and you're getting the most out of the smallest amount of movement. And so, you know, to use it. Look at, uh, there's millions of notes coming out there, but it's like, you know, there's hardly any movement. Actually, what I'm doing. technique. And after a while you get calluses right there. I'll bet. Which is different than the callus there. So Again this involves some recovery muscles, doesn't it? It's a different muscle because it involves a muscle that makes your finger push down and then all of a sudden snap. Right. Get this little snapping thing. Some people's fingers just don't do it. Some people's fingers I don't know, I guess maybe they do if they work on it long enough. But I've seen some people have a real hard time with it. But it's but it's if you can do it, it's a real cool way to and if you really get good at it, you can get some so that snappy. It can actually hammer down with it mm -hmm. without actually playing the note. You really get that snap wailing down on that thing. So it's a real handy thing, and it really helps me out a lot of my playing. I, I use it a lot, you know, I, just to make up for uh, lack of the finger being there. It's real handy. I understand recently you went to Japan as a soloist. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I went over there on the auspices of Yamaha and they. Uh, they did, uh, matter of fact, the uh, TV commercial, you know, that I did with Yamaha. They uh, they ran that before the show and everything like that. I did a couple of neat, like the uh, the double uh, uh, tap thing. I used a lot in the commercial. Let's turn it up.
Yamaha has been a, a great, great help to me uh, in a lot of aspects of my career. And they sent me over to do some bass clinics, you know, and uh, it was really funny because, uh, uh, you know, they do a lot of, like, jazz guys clinics, but they don't do too many rock or pop guys, so they didn't really know what to expect, and, like, the places were all, like, packed and everything, and it was really wild, kids were screaming and yelling, so it was really cool to just go out there alone, no, no, no drums, no guitar, no vocals, no nothing, just go out and play bass. Cool experience. Japanese people were so incredibly great to me. It's like really like being on a different planet there with different language and everything is different. So you have extra strength so you can play bass with big fat strings. So you need the two. Two. No, not, not like this. It's like this. thing about Japanese audiences is they, they really uh, appreciate that soul, blues influence on music. And Japanese audiences also can like many kinds of music. Mm -hmm. Not like in America, it's just, I like only metal, you know, or I will listen only to dance, or I will not listen to anything else but, you know, it's like they listen to everything. Go to Whitney Houston's show, then to a Metallica show, you know, so it's, it is possible to do. I mean, myself, I like a lot of different acts, so it's really interesting to see that I wish they do that in America, you know. What about some of your double-handed techniques? Uh, well, all my techniques are double-handed because i got to use both hands. I mean the tap-on yeah, style. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> all right. Trick um, question. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, that actually developed a long time ago when I saw Billy Gibbons was Dizzy Tap. And when he did that, I thought, oh, great, you can... For, uh, I don't know, one of their... ZZ Top songs we used to do in the old bar dance, bar band. Um, so uh, that's where it kind of came from. And then I realized that after that, you could, wow, you can hit that note, then you could even get more off it like that. And uh, initially, it was meant to just kind of uh, enhance what the whole band was doing. It eventually turned into kind of a solo thing. And you use two fingers, don't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's the one thing that makes it different from uh, a lot of guitar players. I see a lot of guitar players, as soon as they do this tapping thing, and bass players too, they do this like real lightweight, single finger little thing where they flip the note off. Now here's, here's already the huge disadvantage. That first of all, your arm isn't anchored anywhere. Right. So if you're running across a 60 foot stage, like I said before, or even in a bar and people are throwing beer on you, stuff like that, you're, gonna, you're never gonna find out where you are. And your hand isn't gonna be, you're not gonna really know where you are. You've got nothing to really lock to. You know, you're not gonna you know, know where your hand is. So I do the old thumb again, locked on somewhere, like on the edge of the neck usually is a good spot. And also another thing I do, instead of just lightly doing it with one finger, the wrong way, which is down like that, that's just not a normal way for your hand to move. So uh, clamp this finger down on top of it, because on bass, 
Um, as I said before, it's a real strength instrument and you really need a lot of strength to put as much into it as possible so as much comes off of your instrument. You don't have to depend on your amp and all this electronic stuff to make your sound come right. out. You gotta make things read loudly off the instrument itself alone. Physically. Even, even, yes, exactly. So um, the double finger really gives you a chance to I can write off the neck if you want. <laughs> really gives you a chance to really hit down really hard. It gives you way more strength. I mean, if you try it against your hand, it's way more strength down like that. You're going to really need that strength to make it sound loud. So it doesn't slow you up at all. Now, when you do phrases like that, are yeah. you crossing fingers? Oh, yeah. I'll, sometimes I'll get this finger behind. Uh huh. See, because it's all, all you're doing when you're tapping, for, for anybody that doesn't know about it, is, you know, if you're playing a line, you've got like uh, these notes that you're playing. Well, you just move this finger in and play those notes for these fingers. So you're like, you can actually do a double on one finger, a trill like that. Yes. I used to drive keyboard players crazy because they couldn't figure out how I was doing that in the early days. <laughs> so you're hitting. Down, pulling off, hit down, pull off, down, off, down, off. That's an interesting technique. Then you can move it too. And then move out of the. See how the thumb is always right there? Right, an anchor point. Th that way I'll always know that I'm going to hit right on that G and I get that real strength thing. Because I've just, again, I've seen so many guys go out on stage with this incredible technique, you can't hear it. You can't, it doesn't read because there's no strength behind it. Always, you know, everybody spends too much time practicing at home alone. You should be out really with a band playing live and getting the kind of experience you really need to know what works and what doesn't because yes. there's a purpose for learning all this stuff. And it isn't necessary to sit in your bedroom and, and use it, you know, for whatever you're going to use it for. But the, the purpose of it is to perform and communicate and create music. And in order to do that, f for my money, you got to do it live. So a lot of these techniques are meant particular. There may be a lot of other techniques that work very effectively, but this is meant to get out on stage and use under hot lights, with no monitors, with feedback, with everything. Something you can rely on. Exactly. So again, like just a couple of moves, like a... Oh, wait, a I saw you reaching down there. Now, what, what exactly was that all about? Uh, well, let me think now. Oh, okay. So if I was going to get... I need that note there. It's just an idea of how... Hands crossing over. Yeah, it's an idea of how things kind of get invented indiscriminately. They just come up. Mm -hmm. Instead of now, my, my, my arm is tucked into my body and I'm doing this position. Now if I need that note down there, this hand is free, it's not doing anything. Right. Now do I change my whole arm position to stretch down and get that? Or can I keep it in the same place and use that? Yeah. Way easier move. More efficient, isn't it? E and it looks better, too. So <laughs> <laughs> you go over here. I mean, people are like, whoa, what the hell was that? So, but actually, it's way easier to do. Sometimes some things are, are good because they may look, make it look harder than it actually is, but sometimes they're actually useful. Like over-the-neck things. When I first did that, when I first went over-the-neck, um, I found that it was easier for me to get that, those two harmonics there than like this because your hands curve this way. When you put them over the neck, they flatten out. So you want that flat for those harmonics like that. So it always tended to flatten out and be a little easier to do, even though everybody thought it was total showboat. It actually had a, a purpose there right. to be used. So again, so, so when you go behind like that, sometimes there is a use for it. And uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, ways you can do hammer-ons as long as you understand what notes you're going for. The basics of it are to get that real strong, solid blast on that. So if you can do that, then your choice of notes is totally up to you, whatever you end up wanting to do. It's kind of a double. Uh -huh. What's happening there? So there we're dealing adjacent strings? Yeah, we're dealing uh, with a couple techniques in a row there. So what's happening when I pull off this finger, this string with this finger, because there's so much strength behind it, with that other finger on there, it hits the string uh, underneath it and it actually plays that note. So you Almost actually like get a rake. Yeah, it is actually a rake, and it ends up as kind of a 
half rake, half hammer on. So you're gonna have to coin a word here. We don't want a, a raker on or a <laughs> or a ham ache or whatever. Or a ham hock maybe. <laughs> so you get this like flurry of notes. Sounds like almost like flamenco guitar. Or flamingo guitar. That, then you have to do that on one leg though. So, so you get like that's just kind of an inadvertent technique that comes from applying a lot of strength to your hands. And once you just, I, my, my whole purpose in a lot of my exercises and moves is just to create a machine out of my hands so they do, you know, what they have to do on their own. And I can just kind of direct them from another spot in my mind, you know, so I don't have to really think about what I'm playing. Once uh, all the exercises I show with the left hand and all the right hand stuff, once you build up your hands to a good machine, you, you can stop thinking about it because when you think, when you're playing, as you probably well know, you're lost. So you're talking about learning your left hand patterns, your right hand patterns, and finally putting it all together to the point where you don't have to think about it. Yeah. The, um, as I said, when I found out all the things I was doing, it was only after I had actually done them for a long time that I actually sat down and figured out, oh, my finger's on the other side there. No wonder. Because naturally, when I'm playing live and, I'm, and the band is real loud, you can't hear anything, and I'm pressing out hard, the natural thing you want to do is press harder. So out of nowhere, this finger just came around and started doing it like came that. With the help I mean, of just, its assistance yeah, to, of, the, of the next, next door neighbor, you might yeah. as well help him out, you know. So uh, you know, it kind of naturally occurs like that, and it's kind of a natural evolution of thing. And so then, um, again, a lot of this stuff uh, began. I played in a three-piece band for almost my whole life, and so we always had to cover for other players. So I would. Um, the hammering things, like in uh, Schizoid Man, uh, we used to play by King Crimson, that one, there's a soprano uh -huh, sax yeah. trill right in the middle of, of, of like, that, so I had to get Filling that in, in the there. missing part. Yeah, so I always had to fill in the, the extra guitar or keyboard player. So that's where things like, oh, is it a, a double octave? Yes. Basically. That almost sounds like a pianistic technique. Yeah, it's kind of a, well, if you locked your... Or a drum pattern. Yeah, it's, drum, pa it's drum patterns, whatever you might want it to be. Well, it's basically just drum rudiments, tap down. Have you ever seen a, a piano player when they do like octaves? Dun, sure. dun, 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 they kind of lock their hand in that little octave thing so that their fingers will always hit. And so I kind of do the same thing. Uh, again, Trying to, it kind of looks kind of Star Trek-ish, I know, but, <laughs> but um, uh, lock my fingers together like that, mm -hmm. so it's so it's an octave, right? And then this hand, the same thing down here. Uh, it's not the same position for me personally, just because that finger doesn't fit there as well. But uh, I try to double up on this finger to get that low note to sound really well, yeah. and I just hit like like if you're if you're um, uh, just riding along on an A. Right at groove. A little more interesting way of doing it rather than more colorful, more energetic. Yeah. And then you can move it around to And any drum, any drum rudiment you end up doing. And then from that, I got into fifths, where you, where you can actually tap fifths, too, where you do... Individually tap, and you can also individually tap the octaves, too, in any kind of rhythmic pattern you can think of. And then you can get in all kinds of... Now, in all, that case, all, what's going on? Actually, it's just a e, ma it's a e minor chord. So I take these two with that and take these two outside ones. Uh -huh. Break up the chord. Exactly. Now. Mm. So anything you can imagine chord-wise, yeah, anything you can imagine chord-wise, uh, just uh, in your mind, split it up and uh, it's easy to experiment with. But again, um, rather than show you what notes to play, mm -hmm. or try and you know, have people, I mean, who, would, who wants to play the stuff I'm playing anyway, but you know, rather, you know, rather than try, try and show you what notes to play, I'd much rather uh, be able to uh, show people how it is that that's gotten and let people use their own imagination to come right. up with their own moves and stuff. 
Um, so so if, if you understand the idea of that strength, the rhythmic thing, the attack, be able to hit down on the on the uh, on the strings to get a good you know good solid keeping it on the neck at all times of course. Anything you can imagine, you can do in there. So once you once you get the actual hand technique down, because so, so many people try and show people what you know, yes. what notes to play. But you know, I, I think if you really know the technique, you can come up with your own notes. Probably be a little hipper, you know. And basically, that's what we've been covering is techniques, and hopefully that they'll lead to the creation of a new style. Yeah. As they did in you with somebody else. Using yeah, definitely. The same foundation yeah, take, type techniques. You know, for someone to take whatever they want from me, you know, and and hopefully they'll come up with you know something better and. You know, expand on a thing. Because every time I, like I said, and I saw Billy Gibbons do the, I thought, how oh, great. And that eventually turned into all that, all that stuff. Well, actually, all I got was one little thing from him. So hopefully, you know, whatever anybody gets off me, they can extrapolate, I love using that word, yes. from that, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, concoction they can imagine. One last point. What about tapping harmonics? I've seen you do that a lot. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, actually, what that is, is once you get your, your technique down to the point where you're really hitting strongly, almost anything you hit is going to come out as a harmonic. Anywhere along the string, too. In that case, you're playing the overtone series, basically, along the string, aren't you? Is that what that is? Tapping out the notes that would be the open harmonics? Yeah, I guess that is. That, that's actually a scale, I guess. It's... So if you just hit the bass anywhere, like the thing in the, in the Eat Him and Smile record, the uh, in the Going Crazy, people always think, what in the world is that? Yeah, it's, what was that? It's, it's, it's the simplest thing in the world. Just Again, kind of a drum rudiment thing, only tapping harmonics. You get a little distortion and compression on yeah. your bass, it brings those harmonics come ringing, ripping out of there. Get them out like that. That works everywhere. In so addition to there. banging them out that way, you also do a pinch harmonic. Yeah, that thing I just did there. Again, that's a Billy Gibbons uh, idea. I stole yeah. that from there. He's great. He's something, um, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, he sure is. Uh, I think he uses a peso or a quarter or something yeah, for a something pick. And so, and so when he, when the when the pick goes past the string, the soft part of his thumb touches it and he gets the harmonic. So since I don't use a pick, and the only thing I have hard in my hands, at any, well, you could do a lot with that, but I, I won't anyway. The only thing I have in my hands that I can use like that is uh, my fingernails. So um, I use that as the pick with my soft part of my thumb up against it. So actually, if you can, if you want to, I don't know if you can see there, and I would just get kind of a... So the advantage of that is you get a real power to that real... So live, you got Riemann distortion and everything, yeah. you just get those kill harmonics that just watch, you know, people drop in the crowd. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Could you tell us, in your opinion, what should a good bass solo do? Well, like any solo, it should be an element of the song, it should be an extension of the song, also an expression of the individual's spot in the band, in the song. It should be connected. A lot of solos are kind of non sequitur these days. A lot of guys are just riffing mania without any real connection to the song. The guitarist I'm working with now, Paul Gilbert, is uh, it's a good example of someone who can just scream on his instrument when it comes time to knowing a song and, and playing within the context of the song. It, 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 you know, he amazes me. The kid is 22 years old, you know, and he's really an inspiration to me, you know, as a player. I uh, used to come see Talos and sit out in the audience, and his band used to open up for us in Pittsburgh. Now, to, now to be working with us, it was really interesting to see the, the evolution he's taken. I think he's gone ahead so fast because he really understands the value of a song. So, therefore, a soloist, um, especially a bass player, you'll find generally most of the band's going to have to come down in order for a bass player to solo because you can't necessarily cut through sound like a guitarist can. Guitarist higher pitch. So, when things back off, you'll find you're more work directly with a drummer or when things tur turn down or by yourself. So um, you have to really, therefore, know even more of the elements of the song to be able to keep the idea and spirit of the song there while everyone else is gone. 
-hmm. you know, so it's even more important. Where a guitarist can solo can kind of step out of it a little bit more because the whole band is moving around behind him and they're holding it together with him. When the bass player does a solo, it's like, you know, you're standing there naked, you know, yeah. so you have to really come up with something, so to speak. And uh, so what I generally do is, um, uh, what, I, what I know about the modes and keys and things like that, I try and just uh, get real familiar with a key and the moves of a song, kind of stay, stay with it. And you don't necessarily have to go speed demon craze to, to have a good solo. Some of the most effective solos and bass lines, the most memorable ones, are, are not all that complicated. Or, or you know, complex or wild, you know. It's just uh, they're basically element of the song. You know, if you hear like a, sure. you know what you know what song that is sure. already. You know, Cream. so many so many bands. You know, like a, uh, oh, well, I won't get a million examples here, but uh, you know, just to give an idea what the what the song is. The bass should really carry it, and like like you know, stump the band uh -huh. who play in a bass line. You can usually you should be able to tell what the song is in the bass line. That's how much the song should contain the bass line should be, you know, where nowadays you could never play Stump the Band with just the bass line. Right. Like, what song is this? You know, it could be uh, one of a hundred thousand songs that are out there now because they're all, that's what the bass line is in most of them, you know, so you move around a little bit and I think that's the element that you have to have in solos. And as I said before, all the fast, wild stuff that, uh, a lot of people focus in on certain players that do that stuff, and that's really cool, and it's fun as a riot to do. I love doing it, I'll do it for the rest of my life. But um, just understand that it's only a small percentage of playing. Major portion of your playing is right with that drummer, just wailing away with that guy, just moving. When he moves, you move. When he breathes, you breathe. You know, when he blinks, you blink. And I've, I've really worked with drummers a lot uh, where no matter what we do, it happens together. Even things off, totally off the top of our head. You know you really have a magic with the drummer when you can just all of a sudden just be playing along and just take a quick left turn and there he is like right next to you. Yeah, I'm still here with you, you know. So, or he can do the same thing and you're right yeah. with him. You know, that's really the, the true test. So um, anyway, getting back to soloing, you can go as wild as you want and, uh, and uh, some of the techniques and stuff and ideas, I hope that's a building block for a lot of people soloing. But I hope it's also a building block to understand the bass as a whole instrument rather than just... Mm -hmm. Dun, 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 you know, or or as just a flail and maniac thing. It's 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 all of those things, you know. Would the same hold true for an unaccompanied bass solo? Well, for an unaccompanied bass solo, you're pretty much free. I mean, you're mm -hmm. you're free to do whatever you feel do you like. Look you for know? structure, though. Do you look yeah, for memory? I kind of stick around in a certain area, move around, get get an idea of things, build little things up. As I said, most of my stuff's come from playing live, and I, I've thought it up on the spot. Most of my solos. Uh, it was just like, solo time, go, and <laughs> who knows what was going to come out. The downside of that is sometimes it'd be like, oh, it was a little bit too experimental tonight there, <laughs> Bill, so, uh, you know, I don't know. And the, and the upside of it, once in a while, you would hit the nail right on the head, and it would be total magic.
you know, going out on a limb and, and seeing if you can make it happen. But unaccompanied solos are great. But, uh, you know, it, it depends on your audience and what kind of music you're doing. In a country and western band, I don't think you'd be doing too many unaccompanied, unaccompanied bass band. solos, you know. You know, I don't think uh, Whitney Houston's bass player would be doing unaccompanied bass, you know, like that. But, you know, and, and other kinds of music, it's, it's, that's the case. And if it's entertaining enough, you know, it can be valid. But I think bottom line is entertainment on it, too, you know. And uh, musical technique is underneath communication. Communication is first, technique comes second. So if you're communicating, you're doing it, no matter what your technique is. Now available from Cherry Lane, Billy Sheehan Bass Secrets transforms your technique into powerful performances. Billy explains application and presentation. In-depth interviews with Wolf Marshall cover working in a band setting and extensive footage with drummer Pat Torpy from Billy's band, Mr. Big, shows how a dynamic rhythm section functions in studio and on stage. Also available from Cherry Lane, Rock with the Pros. Cherry Lane's music folios feature note-for-note -note transcriptions of the best music ever recorded, standard notation, and tablature versions of the hottest hits and rock classics include tips on how to get the same sound you hear on the record. Guitar, bass, and drum editions let you play it like it is. Where there's smoke, there's guitar recordings. All new material by Leslie West, Billy Sheehan, Jennifer Batten, and others along with the latest releases by Randy Coven and Blues Saracino. The hottest instrumentals from the hottest guitarists around. Guaranteed rock and roll. And it's all from the same people who bring you the best-selling guitar magazine in America, Guitar for the Practicing Musician, articles on the biggest bands and the best players in the business, updates on the newest equipment, interviews, posters, and about 30 bucks worth of sheet music every month. Subscribe now and save. For more information on any of these products, call us at 1-800-331-5269.